Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Steve, for a very kind introduction. I'm realising that it's actually quite a nerve-wracking business to give a paper in one's own seminar series. I much prefer to be on the other side of this lectern. But I'm very grateful to so many people for coming, especially in the miserable weather that we've had today. Um, in this paper, I'm going to consider a question which has kept historians and other scholars busy for some decades working within psychiatry and its history. Was madness a female malady? And if so, in what ways and why? Although I'll be situating the discussion in a, a slightly wider European context in areas of the talk, I'll draw on one specific institution to flesh out the main points that I wish to make. And obviously, given the lecture series that I'm speaking in, and very delighted to be speaking in, um, that institution is the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. Some of you will have been at previous talks in the, the lecture series. Uh, it marks an important 200th birthday this year, so I'll be focusing on that institution. You'll forgive me if I mostly refer to it as the Royal Edinburgh Asylum because as a historian, sort of constantly trapped in the past, I prefer not to be anachronistic and to refer to it by language that we would use in the 21st century when referring to the 19th century. And that is the century that I've decided to focus on for this paper. Many interesting things could have been said if I went on to the 20th, but time didn't allow me to either do that research or to present it in 35, 40 minutes. Please also understand that if I use terminology like insanity, it's for exactly the same reason, so as not to be anachronistic. I'm going to begin with an image, however, that is not local. It's probably one of the most famous images within the history of psychiatry. You pick up any textbook on that history and you are very likely to see this image. And it depicts the French physician Philippe Pinel, who famously freed the insane in late 18th century Paris. And this is often seen as a politically symbolic act, akin to freeing the prisoners from the Bastille. This legendary event was commemorated in many paintings, uh, including this particular one. It's one that particularly does the rounds. Some of you will know this history, but Pinel is popularly known as having been very instrumental in the development of a more humane approach to the care of the mentally ill. And this, we are told, was the beginning of the end for the sort of chains and manacles approach of the early asylums, where we're often told patients were treated more like wild beasts who'd lost all reason and thereby humanity. Institutions across Europe including famously in Britain, the York Retreat, quickly appeared as progressive tonics to previously brutal and dehumanising regimes, offering instead what's been referred to as moral therapy, a less physical approach which tended to involve careful observation and classification of patients, much more talking to patients and encouraging them to be active, rewarding their good behaviour, and making very minimal use of physical restraints. While I'm sure there is much truth in that account, scholars have critiqued it on a number of levels. For example, and most famously perhaps, the French philosopher Michel Foucault has argued that moral therapy was merely a more subtle form of control than its more aggressive precursor, and that its humanitarian motives should not be overly stressed. But another critique has focused on um, a gendered reading of this image, and that's really why I'm beginning with it. Elaine Showalter, in a hugely influential book, The Female Malady, from which I take my title, notes that the painting commemorating this historic occasion depicts the insane as mad women. Yes, they range in age from uh, youth to senility, but the gendered division is very clear to see. 
because what we also see is that the representatives of sanity and reason in the painting are exclusively male. This division between feminine madness and masculine rationality is further emphasised by the three figures who are at the centre. Do I have a... Yes, so we see these three central figures who we can pick up on. We have at the very centre the lovely, passive, modest and dishevelled young woman. There's the keeper behind her, the attendant, who appears to be freeing her, but in a style where he holds up her arm as though she's some kind of life-sized doll being wound up at the back. And then we have the very dignified Pinel, the man himself, standing authoritatively alongside, his scientific rationality and paternal authority clearly on show. Another patient you can see is carefully kissing his hand. Historical accounts indicate that Pinel first removed the chains of several male inmates and got around to the women several weeks later. So then we must ask, why has the artist chosen to focus exclusively on depicting the freeing of insane women? Why the stark gendered terms of this painting? Nor is this image atypical in case that's what you're thinking. Because if we look more broadly at visual representations of insanity over the last two centuries, I think it's very hard to escape what we might call a feminization of madness, a tendency to siphon madness into... Indeed, the majority of such images seem to not only feminize madness but sexualize the mad woman, to paint her as sexually provocative or at least slightly disheveled, having lost the delicate modesty that one would expect of a rational and decent woman who had the decency to conform to social norms. Flowers and straw in the hair are often used also to symbolise sexual availability and a sort of lapsed social decorum. Much of this is uh, symbolised well in, in um, Hamlet's Ophelia. I'm picturing the, the recent Kenneth Branagh version here because Kate Winslet does a very good job of playing out these stereotypes, both in her dress and in her behaviour. So we see her in the, the typical dishevelled bedclothes with the loose hair falling around her face. In another scene, she uh, falls to the floor, writhing and thrusting her pelvis in a grotesquely sexual and inappropriate manner, and she sings body songs as she does so. This is all very unbefitting of her social status, and it's all meant to play into these obvious stereotypes of female madness. I think one must not exaggerate the feminization of madness, because of course, some images can be found depicting male lunatics. Hogarth is often brought out at these occasions. Uh, portrayals of the madman as an aggressive, semi-nude figure, a muscular and violent barbarian. But these kind of images, historians I think have convincingly argued, were increasingly on the way out, um, dealt several blows in the early 19th century when doctors such as the Scottish surgeon Sir Charles Bell depicted the madman visually as a pneumatic muscle man who must be manacled for everyone's safety. But he describes him in the accompanying text of his 1806 book, Essays on the Anatomy of Expression in Painting, as, quote, lying with a death-like gloom, devoid of energy, as passive as any mad, mad woman one might meet. So even when the visuals suggested a certain masculinity in the madness, the passive behaviour was more indicative of madness as a female malady. Moreover, scholarship suggests that as the 19th century progressed, there was a marked displacement of raving male lunatics with the sexually loose or aggressive mad women that I've pictured some of earlier. Um, I, I won't depict this image for you, but I, I do want to show that hairstyles do vary in depictions of the, of the mad women. Flowing locks are not the exclusive depiction. I'm happy to talk about this more at the end if anyone wants a deconstruction. If we accept the dominance of the mad woman in a visual sense, then I think a next, natural next step is to ask to what extent these kind of depictions are reflected in a more statistical sense. Um, i.e. when we look at asylum records 
Is this feminisation reflected in the actual admission and diagnosis of patients? I mentioned this famous book. In the 1980s, Elaine Showalter famously argued that madness was a female malady because it was experienced by more women than men, that the fairer sex constituted the majority of asylum patients. So not just the way that they're represented on a visual level, she's talking on a more empirical level too about actual asylum realities, if you like. She and others have thus gone on to explore why it might be that women more than men are likely to suffer from mental ill health or at least to seek treatment through the medical profession for their difficulties. I want to make it clear I'm not suggesting that Showalter has offered nothing to, the, to scholarship, far from it. Amongst other things, she's, um, she's been absolutely right to say that gender has been scandalously neglected in scholarship on the history of psychiatry. And from the 1980s, she did a massive amount to stimulate further work in the discipline. And it has allowed others to come along with perhaps more nuanced critiques of the place of gender in that history. But for those of us who've gone on to explore in more statistical and quantitative and qualitative detail individual asylums, we have found a slightly different story. Certainly, I can speak more about the British context here, but as you can see, her work was on English culture. As you will know if you've attended other lectures in this series, the Royal Edinburgh was one of the largest and most prestigious asylums in Britain in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And if you don't know, it leaves behind a really tremendous archive which give, with people from LHSA here. It gives me great pleasure to say publicly that in my own research and teaching, it's played an enormous part. We're very lucky to have such an archive on our doorstep, which reflects the importance historically of that institution. Um, I don't intend to bombard you with figures but I thought you probably should see some kind of visual representation of the statistics. Um, for your delight, I quickly graphed male and female admissions to that institution from around 1832 to 1900. What you will see is a slight preponderance of female admissions overall. But this is by no means consistent, as I think will be clear to you, across this uh, slightly less than a century. Um, I don't need to read out the figures, but there are occasions, just one, 1847, where 134 men and 117 women were admitted. That's not uncommon. Um, but I, of course, must back that up by saying that the basic ratio of men to women becomes much more meaningful, I think, if we take these admissions within the context of wider society, which lay outside the asylum, and ask ourselves whether asylum admissions were proportionate or disproportionate to the gender ratio in Scotland as a whole. What we see for the Royal Ed, and also for other British asylums that I have read about in this period, is that women were admitted to these institutions in a proportion perfectly appropriate to their numbers in the population at large, i.e. gender doesn't appear to have played a significant dominant role in their committal. Also, if we look at censuses, and I've only done so for about for 1851 and 1861, we learn that the Scottish female population was around 110 women to every 100 men. So therefore, I think it's natural to expect, maybe on a basic level, that male admissions would be slightly less than female. Overall, I think we see a rather proportionate balance between the sexes inside and outside the institution. And therefore, although I won't go into it now, I want to just make the point that in many respects, the history of asylums like the Royal Aid, they're really a microcosm of the outside world. We often treat them as though they're alien institutions which bear no relation to their surroundings. But in its gender composition, as in many other aspects, I think it really is a representative sample, if you like, um, of the outside world. It might also be worth mentioning cure rates in this period, which has appeared to have been slightly higher in females than in males. Now, one 
explanatory framework that scholars often use for this is that households would have a greater need for the male breadwinner to be released home or not to be placed in the asylum at all, whereas women might be more dispensable. And indeed, this has led to suggestions that they were altogether dispensable and could therefore languish in asylums if for any reason their male families wish to, wish to get rid of them. Um, I certainly didn't have time to indulge in the very laborious task of trying to measure average length of stay for both sexes, um, but there is data from the mid-19th century I have from the Royal Aid, just as a sample, which reveals that men were more likely to have been released without cure, and I suspect that men's average stay would have been shorter than women's because of this economic need for them to return back to their families. I also suspect, although again this is slight, you know, slight hearsay, that men were likely sent to the asylum at a slightly later stage in their, um, their illness. We know this from other asylums, certainly, since poor families might well be reluctant to lose their main source of income. I'm focusing on the 19th century partly for reasons of time, but also because it's easier to gain access to the records. Closed records become much more of a phenomenon in the 20th century. One thing I noticed towards the very end of the period and into the 20th century is there seems to statistically be something happening where I think females are beginning to predominate in the admissions, possibly in a slightly disproportionate way. But as I say, today I want to focus on 19th century. I just mentioned that. If we move on now to look in more qualitative terms at how the doctors of the Royal Edinburgh were portraying and discussing patients, um, I think we, we need to get into that side of the, the debate. I'm going to particularly focus on one doctor um, who was one of the most famous to have been based at the Royal Ed, uh, Dr Thomas Clouston, later Sir Clouston. Um, who was physician superintendent for 35 years in the later 19th century. I have a picture here, which I like to see is on his day off, um, dressed down, but you can't, can't see it now because of the lights, but Alan Beveridge pointed out there's a, there's a portrait of Clouston peeking from behind this pillar as well. Um, and certainly he deserves his place here um, in medical terms as a socially significant, historically significant figure, but also um, for the historian, he's a fantastic resource because he was a prolific writer. Um, he wrote clinical textbooks, but he wrote in a variety of formats for a variety of audiences. There can't be much that Clouston thought that we don't have evidence of left behind because he left such a rich paper trail. On his arrival at the Royal Ed in 1873, Clouston and, and thereafter, Consistently, Clouston stressed that good mental health was dependent on adherence to Victorian standards. Part of his teaching was very much about accepting your rightful place in Victorian society and adhering to cultural norms. And this was in terms of gender, but also class. So one of the things he advocated was a very rigid division of labour within the asylum in sexual terms. Women's work was motherhood, which fulfilled her personally, as it also served the needs of society. As Clouston put it, men's chief work was more related to the present, while women's chief work was related to the future of the world. He argued passionately that women's chief work, um, women should focus in their chief work, uh, their, focus all their energies on becoming the mothers uh, that they could be reach their full potential as mothers, and that this in particular meant that they should cease to become educated after adolescence, and ideally just before. Because reproduction, he argued, placed very sizable demands on their mind and on their constitution. This transition from child to womanhood um, would exhaust them if they tried to do it in conjunction with anything else. Over-education, he argued, would produce fewer offspring, and those who were born would be um, of a puny kind. In broader terms, he continued, the girl student who has concentrated all her force on cramming book knowledge is apt to suffer the effects of an inharmonious mental and bodily constitution. He described this damage as irreparable. It was much better for a woman to be unharnessed 
um, by misdirected education. He didn't want her to use up all her brain energy and leave none for reproductive purposes. He summed up, therefore, in this quote, who in his senses can deny that it's far better for 19 women out of 20 to be healthy than to be intellectually well-educated? No acquirements of knowledge can possibly make up for health in afterlife. Of course, I think we should contextualise Clouston's concerns here amidst, for example, suffragette-type movements to promote, to promote female emancipation and equality, leading scholars to suggest that this was some kind of social ploy to control women and to maintain a male-dominated status quo. And we also must note that Clouston, although he prolifically left us many good quotes on the subject, was not atypical of 19th century doctors in his thinking here. What we are seeing here is a very willful rejection um, of the angel in the home ideal being linked strongly to the idea of mental instability. Where their female patients were concerned, uh, 19th century psychiatrists appeared to define their task as the maintenance of brain stability in the face of almost overwhelming physical odds. A woman's biological destiny was very much tied up with her ability to stay on the right side of good mental health. She had to operate within strict boundaries of marriage and childbearing. And it was often suggested by Clouston and by others that to work within the marital and maternal context was the safest way for women to avoid insanity. However, some doctors did suggest that even the reproductive domain wasn't necessarily the safest of places for women to shelter. Indeed, many 19th century psychiatrists believed women to be more vulnerable to insanity due precisely to an instability, an inherent instability in their reproductive systems and that this naturally interfered with rational control. They tended to link theories of female insanity not just to childbearing, but actually to all parts of the female reproductive and life cycle. So we see mention of insanity linked to female puberty, pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, and menopause, which stretches out through very much uh, most of a woman's life. Puerperal insanity was a term that was coined to encompass that form of insanity which befell pregnant women and new mothers and could apparently strike any class of women. This diagnostic label, the terrible antithesis of the maternal ideal, seemed to cover quite a miscellany of symptoms, from relatively brief nervous upsets to a very violent mania and severe melancholia, which could threaten the life of both mother and child. Infanticide was seen to be a grave threat at that time. While it was seen as emblematic of women's intrinsic biological weakness, fragile nervous systems and unpredictable reproductive organs. The contravention of feminine domestic behavioural norms demonstrated by such patients was quite shocking at a time when their families needed them most. With motherhood set as the ideological centre of femininity, any inability to adapt to the demands of maternity and domesticity was an inability to perform a woman's most important and fundamental life functions. The scholar Anne Digby has nicely referred to femininity as a biological straitjacket which constrained women to operate with very narrowly defined feminine norms. Another disease which appears to be linked very obviously to female reproductive biology is hysteria, a disorder named from the Greek word for uterus. Um, a relatively small number of women were diagnosed as hysterical in the Royal Edinburgh Annual Reports. I've found about 140 for the second half of the 19th century. So not of massive statistical significance, but they're there. They allow us to explore them to see what kinds of women these were and what the doctors say about them. The average age of these women was 24, so very youthful. And the average length of stay, which I was more struck by, was about seven years. I think it's worth saying that the mythology that surrounds the Victorian asylum tends to give an impression that people entered these institutions and then the key was thrown away. And in fact, we know from much um, 
uh, number crunching by historians, that actually the length of stay could be far, far shorter than that, a, a, a you know, period of weeks or months. My experience of looking through case notes is that that kind of average length of stay is, is, is really quite remarkable. It's certainly true that hysteria remained closely bound to ideas of femininity. And in the Royal Edinburgh Asylum, it, there was a strong association with abnormal menstruation and, I suppose, a sort of aberrant female biology. But it is important, I think, to add that a small number of men were also diagnosed with hysteria, and the Royal Edinburgh Asylum was not alone here. Uh, much more famously, in the late 19th century, the French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot was involved in a very spirited controversy actively discussing the diagnosis of hysteria in adolescent and adult males. He published case histories of more than 60 male hysterics and he treated countless others in his daily hospital practice. He wrote very enthusiastically about hysteria um, in females too. And indeed, this is another of probably the most famous images in the history of psychiatry alongside Philippe Pinel's freeing of the insane. So this is a demonstration of hysteria um, at the Salpetria, a Parisian asylum. But once again, you'll see it's, it's really very caricaturish in a way in its visual representation of the condition. Roll in once again the beautiful doll-like female patient surrounded by the penetrating gaze of the male doctors. This off-the-shoulder number seems to be a very prominent look. Um, Charcot did, as I say, diagnose the disease in both sexes, and in fact he conceptualised the disease in very similar ways. He argued that it was a disease caused by a combination of underlying constitutional factors and short-term triggers, and that it wasn't really sexual in nature. Menstruation, for example, figured only rarely in his discussion of the female patients so diagnosed, nor did menopause or pregnancy feature much in his writings. And despite the Victorian obsession with masturbation as a great male vice, Charcot made little mention of it as a cause of hysteria. He really dismissed sexual theories of hysteria in either sex. This can be contrasted with admissions to the Royal Aid. While these women's cause of insanity certainly wasn't attributed solely to their reproductive biology, around 20% of female admissions were linked explicitly to problems with their reproductive health. And actually, as the, as the 19th century progresses, we see that figure creep up. By about 1900, something like 40%, slightly more, um, were being diagnosed. The hysterical patients were being diagnosed as having a link to reproductive um, difficulties. And that actually was exactly the, the time period where Clouston was becoming most exercised with the perils of female education. But so far I've made very little mention of another variable. Historians talk about the key variables when you're looking at analytically at the past of gender and class and sometimes an increasingly race. And class I haven't mentioned much at all. And I think that's actually crucially important within these debates. And more recently historians have begun to, to recognise the important variable that this is. Let's return to a puerperal insanity, insanity of childbirth, so I can illustrate for you the significance of class. And I'm particularly using the work of Hilary Marland here, who's done great work on puerperal insanity as a diagnostic label in the past, using Royal Aid and other asylum materials. She found that plenty of poor women admitted to the Royal Aid were, were receiving this diagnosis, but it was for reasons of poverty rather than biology. Biological factors were certainly drawn upon strongly to explain the committal of many women to asylums like the Royal Edinburgh, and especially those diagnosed with puerperal insanity, a disease very obviously tied to their bodies, one might think, you know, pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding. These women were often vulnerable, however, in a much broader environmental sense, if I can call it that. So treatment of puerperal insanity actually took the form of most urgently addressing the women's emaciated status and their general bodily debility. Uh, the women were fed up. There was a feeding up culture with custard, egg, jelly and milk. 
as Clouston referred to it, the gospel of fatness. He had various gospels of work, play, and gospel of fatness was equally important in his um, sort of um, regime of therapeutics. He argued that fat was a key ingredient for a healthy woman, both physically and mentally. Indeed, Marland has argued that committal to the asylum might well have been a very positive thing for these poor women, opening up the possibility of respite from household and maternal duties. It would also give them cleaner, more comfortable living quarters and better nutrition, and arguably escape from husbands who sometimes constituted, in her words, an outright danger to their wife's sanity. We do know that there were instances where husbands demanded the return of their wives and removed them back home, in spite of strong medical um, advice to the contrary. This could be said to suggest that 19th century doctors in asylums like the Royal Edinburgh were providing asylum in the true sense of the word, a place of protection and safety. And it wasn't all by any means about an enthusiastic, perhaps misogynistic display of patriarchal authority, which is what feminist historians have very much claimed. It may be that Showalter's thesis does hold water about the dominance of, of female admissions and this feminization of madness in statistical as well as visual terms. But certainly, um, when we come to statistical data, any validity to her arguments appears to revolve around women of a very specific socio-economic group, that being kind of upper middle class women. Because where working class admissions and diagnoses were concerned, the story appears to be rather different. In the pursuit of equal opportunities, I also want to stress the fact that Clouston did not necessarily treat his male patients very differently and expected them similarly to conform to certain Victorian ideals. I always feel that when we talk about gender history, there seems to be this, this, this idea that actually it means, it, it means the feminine, feminine sex. Um, but gender, of course, in my title, I want also to talk a little bit about male patients. Clouston did not advocate reckless sexual or social behaviour in men and saw men as being composed equally of finite energy which could be spent but it would be to their great detriment. So he advocated that men transform their sex energy into the forces of work and thought to be achieved through regular muscular exercise, games and cold baths. And that was particularly necessary during their schooling, their adolescent years. So this was seen as a source of great strain for men as well as women. Clouston warned in particular about the, quote, wreckage of happiness caused by early sexual indulgences, citing poets as an obviously uncontrolled race who paid dearly for their early lapses. He particularly lamented the Scottish poet and lyricist Rabbi Burns, saying how different would Burns' career have been had the purity of his songs been the keynote of his life. So it's important, I think, to contextualise what we read by feminist historians about these conceptualisations of women and their bodies and their mental health by also looking then at what was being said about men. I don't think that's done quite as much as it should be. We can nicely see these sorts of moral judgments being made in a disease, I was going to say close to my heart, which might not be the right way to put it, but a disease I'm certainly very interested in as a scholar, which is general paralysis of the insane, GPI, a devastating psychiatric disease which afflicted a staggering 20 or 20 so percent of men who were admitted to the Royal Edinburgh Asylum in the later 19th century. And it really was a disease of men as much as hysteria was a disease of women because up to 11 you know, men for every fee, one female who would have been admitted um, were the, the common scenario. Okay, hysteria was slightly more pronounced, but there was a vast disproportionate amount of men who were diagnosed with GPI. Its symptoms, just briefly, were a severe um, bodily paralysis in conjunction with the symptoms we sadly know as degenerative dementia. Um, it was invariably fatal. It accounted for about a third of the asylum's deaths per year. And maybe most worrying of all, it was diagnosed predominantly in middle-aged men, the breadwinners of their generation. Those, therefore, the, the socio-economic implications of this disease were a real source of, of worry 
Um, GPI was effectively a disease of late syphilis. We now know it as a form of neurosyphilis, but the causative link to syphilis wasn't known, um, or at least firmly dis established, until the early 20th century. So it's interesting to look at how doctors conceptualised the disease beforehand. And in the 19th century, we see them discuss the disease as the result of a complex interplay between the temptations, excesses and vices of urbanisation and modern civilisation. They were particularly exercised with excess in Victorian psychiatry, particular of sexual and alcoholic excess, although excess tea drinking, excess religion could also be mentioned. In short, as Thomas Clouston pithily noted, rising rates of GPI were, quote, a bad sign of our ways of life. Indeed, given the particular focus on debauchery and indulgence in the excesses of alcohol, tobacco and sexuality, GPI was related to an immoral lifestyle decades before the syphilis link was widely accepted, leading doctors such as Clouston explicitly to adopt the role of moral arbiter in their discussions of and dealings with such patients. Clouston stressed that good mental health was dependent on adherence to Victorian standards and that they must distinguish between harmful or self-destructive behaviour and that which was prudent or prophylactic, encouraging patients to quote, live according to physiological and moral law in order to lessen the total amount of the great nervous disturbances. So what he's saying, and others also are saying at this time, is that good mental health demanded strict adherence to the Victorian moral values of continence and self-control. GPI epitomises this, I think, very nicely. In a world of growing secularisation, physicians like Clouston appeared to have believed that the scientist should replace the, the priest um, as the judge of important life questions. As he put it, the social reformer, the clergy and the educationalist have an uphill fight with human nature, and as yet, not an altogether successful one. Let science now step into the aid. Psychiatrists were thereby assuming a wider professional and social role as the appropriate moral guardians of both society and the individual. Indeed, Clouston referred to psychiatrists in his writings as priests of the body, a nice evocative phrase, I think. So to their patient populations, doctors like Clouston were, in his words, guardian, advisor, protector and healer. And as GPI so well illustrates, it was not just women who needed this guidance. So if I draw things to a conclusion, I've tried to, in this talk, give a flavour of feminist interpretations of the history of psychiatry, which have focused to a large extent on this so-called feminisation of madness, both in its visual representations and more quantitatively in terms of asylum admissions. While there's clear evidence for the visual aspect, when we turn to the empirical sources, those of the Royal Edinburgh and other British asylums, they simply do not bear out a disproportionate diagnosing of madness in women or the portrayal of mental illness as inherently um, female in nature. In fact, mental illness seems to have blighted the lives of men and women in a quite proportionate way commensurate with their representation in the adult population. Nor do particularly feminine diagnostic labels it trouble the institution's annual reports and case notes in significant numbers, despite, despite a clear association in medical textbooks of female biology with fragility and irrationality. Within the Royal Edinburgh Asylum, puerperal insanity was not especially commonly diagnosed and hysteria was barely seen at all. Plus it was on occasion, as I said, diagnosed in men. In more qualitative terms, we can certainly see psychiatric attempts to label and control what could be described as aberrant behaviour, but this is seen in men as in women. Discussions of, for example, female education do smack to us today of an obvious level of sexism, even misogyny, that would make most of us uncomfortable. In making these arguments, doctors were providing a biological rationale for gender differentiation. 
There was also a rather obvious class discrimination going on here, given working class women's need to embark upon harder physical labour, excluding them somewhat from the female equals frailty equation that doctors found so socially desirable. But in a broader sense within the asylum, I'm not sure we can use such writings to suggest that psychiatrists were policing only femininity. Doctors like Thomas Clouston were most keen to judge and regulate everyone's behaviour and to teach prudent adherence to the Victorian moral values of self-control and respectability, men and women alike. Only by living a good moral life of self-control and by conforming to the social and cultural norms of your sex could one avoid a trip to Morningside, whether male or female. Here endeth the lesson. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.